Welcome to Unsilent with your hosts, Dave and Brian. This is not another current events podcast. We're digging deeper, diagnosing, and discussing what's really going on today, how we got here, and providing observations for future generations. Welcome to Unsilent. We're Brian and Dave, and today we are in the wild. If you look at our background, you can follow us on unsilentpodcast.com, Rumble, any social channels, and we'd love to hear your feedback as well. So let's get into it. Brian, what is uh, going on in that uh, stark white background place that you're at? Yeah, well, I'm in, a, I'm in an Airbnb in the People's Republic of Washington. They haven't put up a wall yet, so it's still easy to fly in. Um, but so I don't have my microphone. The, the sound quality is not going to be as good as it normally is. And I have this huge white background with the sun coming through this window, glaring off my noggin. So uh, both audio and video are suffering this episode. But uh, like you said, we're in the wild. So that's in the way the wild. it goes. <clears throat> right. Um, I've been on vacation for a couple weeks. So the last couple episodes we released, you and I pre-recorded. So we haven't had a chance yet to talk about the RFK um, uh I don't know if you call it a switch or uh, how would you describe that? I, I mean, so people looking back in this 60 years from now, are going to be, they're going to read it through the lens of history and it'll be de- described as some way, but how would you describe what, what happened here? Well, I mean, I, I don't think it fits a category, an easy category to describe. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if there's any category, you know, there's um, uh, of course we, the, the last serious, third party candidate that we had was Ross Perot back in yeah. the Clinton, uh, George Bush senior scenario. And then Perot was a serious candidate. He got a serious amount. Of course he didn't switch like RFK did, but I, I think it, I categorically, I think it signals a, a difference in our electoral politics, um, versus even, even that, <clears throat> because, um, you know, you, you've got, You've got Trump, who's a populist. You've got RFK, who is, <clears throat> I, I don't know exactly how you would describe him. He's, he's a Democrat, but he's uh, uh, against the establishment. So there's this new, and, and it's, it's interesting, it's not just here, too. I've been watching the elections in Europe as well, and the traditional categories of right and left, conservative, liberal, uh, are not you know, they're not there. So, you know, yeah. there, there, there's, uh, there's, um, there's some uh, elections recently, and we'll get back to RFK in a moment, but uh, there were some elections recently in, um, in basically uh, regions of Germany that were formerly East Germany. And the, the, what they call, what the economist calls the far right and the far left are the ones that kind of uh, won. But the, the interesting um, got, got the most votes. But the interesting thing about this, and this correlates over to RFK, is that uh, some of the positions of the quote unquote far right and far left overlap. Yeah. So you've got Trump here, which is uh, Republican, but not conservative. I think that's fair to say. No, I'd um, say he's he's as Republican as Bill Clinton was in 1992. Yes, exactly. So he's so he's not a Republican, uh, but he's a populist, or he he is a he is a Republican, but not a conservative. But he is a populist. Yeah. And you've got RFK, who has rejected the Democratic Party and is does and holds some of their positions, but doesn't hold others. So he can't be really considered a a, a liberal in the sense of of of. I mean, it's it's all very confusing, frankly. Yeah. I mean. Uh, with with all these and there's a lot of overlap, so the traditional categories uh, no longer seem to apply. And it, that, seems, it seems to me to be as significant as in whatever it was, 1960 or 58 or something like that, when you know the Republican Party is the party that that got our country out of slavery. It right. was it was founded for the purpose of abolition and yeah. all that, right? Yep. And then somewhere, I can't remember the year, somewhere around 1960, though, um, that shifted. And the Democrat Party became the party that took on the civil rights movement and all that kind of stuff, right? There's sure. a massive, like, shift that happened. And I've heard historians pin it down to a singular phone call that JFK made to, I think, Coretta Scott King. Yeah. And Richard Nixon did not make that phone call. And historically, Richard Nixon would have made that phone call because the Republicans were the party of the— Right. Black voters and civil rights and things like that. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know all the details, but he didn't make the phone call. Kennedy did, 
and boom, overnight it shifted. And it feels like that magnitude of a shift going on right now to me, yeah, where yeah. it's less about the um, declared party. Like you said, Trump's running as a Republican, but he's not conservative. He, If you match up his policies to Bill Clinton's in 1992, I'd say they're, they're pretty darn close. Um, uh, JF or RFK Jr., lifelong Democrat, arguably from the most Democrat family you could possibly be from. Right. Yeah, exactly. In, in our country's history. I mean, unless your last name is Roosevelt, that's the only thing that I can imagine that you can come close is like right. Kennedy, right? Close thing we have to a royal family in our country. Right. And he's left the Democrat Party. And it feels to me like both of these kind of outsiders, um, Trump is the first guy to run for president who did not come up through other politics or through the military. Great right. outsider. <clears throat> and RFK yep. Jr. has has been, you know, on this on this uh, path of this, you know, allegiance to the Democrat party. And now he's broken away, but they're both kind of anti-establishment. Is that a fair way to yeah. say it? You think? Yeah, yeah very, very okay. much so. Yeah. So it feels to me like there's this unification happening that is not bound by traditional party lines. That's really about is the, is the future of the country going to serve the people or is it the future of the company going to, or country going to serve the institutions? And yeah, it, it see that's it's interesting to me because in in the past, as you're talking about this, um, coming up with what is what is their governing what is their what is their political uh, governing philosophy? You know, I'm I'm very much interested in in those kinds of discussions, and yeah. the and and I think you hit it there. It's there isn't really, you know, conservatism, you know, you've got lots of different things that point to smaller government and lower taxes and power devolving to the people and, you know, these kinds of things. Liberalism is bigger government and uh, a more aggressively involved government helping people, you know, this type of thing. So that's been the kind of the, the, the discussion and the argument or debate that's been going on for now decades. Uh, yeah. Those sort of, but but there's a there's a philosophical basis to it. Whereas the the new kind of philosophy of this emerging populism, the JFK or RF, RFK Jr. Trump populism, seems to be yes, and sort of an, an anti-establishment. You know that that's the core of it. It's sort of anti-establishment, yeah. whether it's medical establishment, whether it's uh, sort of big business, but then you know Trump's big business and Elon Musk is big business. Uh, there, there, so there's there's a developing sort of anti where we have been and and anti control anti big brother sort of that that seems to be where the philosophy is and beyond that it's like the some of the other things that used to be core like take take trump and abortion um you know that's been a core republican conservative you know cause forever uh and regardless of of what's happened with roe v wade the that Trump's sort of downplaying that. So and yeah. and and also going after big business, JD Vance, you know, uh, yeah. going after big business. So uh, so a new philosophy, and so I, I think it's a fledgling I, nor idea. It's sort of come out of because the that kind of idea, that kind of anti-establishment thing, has been fringy. It's been you know, it's been on the fringes uh, up until well, now. I, I kind of I've, I've been you know, I just processing this, and again, I don't think I'm doing a good enough job of articulating how significant this is. This is massive. I mean, yeah, RFK Jr. leaving the Democrat Party to join forces with the enemy is akin to nothing I can remember in my lifetime happening on uh, as far as significance of people just kind of thumbing their nose at the people in charge, right? Yeah, but exactly. as I've been, you know, I've now had, a, it's, I don't know, it happened a week and a half ago or something like that as you and yeah. I are recording this, but as I've had time to process it, it kind of, it kind of supports, and so you know, all, we're all narcissists, including me, right? So it kind of supports my notion of when you and I started doing this podcast was who can speak for the 80% of the people in the middle of the populace who aren't fringe right and fringe left? Like the 10, right. take out the 10% either either in the spectrum. That's where all the money comes from to support yep. the politicians to run for office. That's where all the lobbying happens at those fringe 10%. And yep. so when you and I first started doing mm -hmm. this, like part of our conversation was, how do we explain what this is like for the middle 80% who are stuck through this both of those extremes suck from our perspective. Right. And, and it kind of feels like that's, there's an awakening happening about that in, in that. What I mean is before, if you were a conservative, you thought that, 
you know, the other team is the only one who could be bad and all roads lead to communism. And if you're right. a liberal, you thought the other team were, were the bad guys and all roads lead to fascism. And I right. think what's starting to happen is people are starting to become aware of it doesn't matter if you if you go through communism, fascism, the, the path that we are going down is control of the institutions right. and less control of the people. Right. And it feels to me like like this represents a breaking away of those party lines and, and seeing that whether it's fascism or communism or whatever, whatever conglomeration of those two things it would be, it's that extreme control versus the freedom for us to say things we want to say without having to worry about being canceled or losing our jobs or whatever. It, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's really at the core of it. And I think it's because um, the the previous regimes became so entrenched with, you know, the, the, the lobbyist, big business, big government, uh, you know, spend and tax, you know, all that became so uh, entrenched that nobody feels like they've got any voice anymore. And so whether yeah. it's uh, the Teamsters, uh, speaking at the RNC or and I mean, not that, the DNC and not oh, the DNC. Geez. Yeah. I mean, so, so yeah, I, I do, I think that's what it is. I think it's a, it's a natural reaction to the system becoming so entrenched and big and powerful and people not feeling either right or left that they have a voice, um, that you've got a, a growing groundswell of a sort of societal revolution. I mean, um, and, yeah. and I, and the, the, the interesting thing is <clears throat> where's that going to go? I mean, usually these things develop things, things, whether they're, and I don't, I'm not, advocating for any kind of, you know, armed revolution or anything like that, but, but any kind of societal revolutions usually start off around one or two ideas, you know, or any, any big protest movement, or they all start off around one or two ideas. Then eventually they, you know, get committees together and organize themselves and, you know, put in bureaucracies and all this kind of stuff. We're at this sort of the very beginning of this with the shocks like RFK and Trump joining forces. So where it's going to go is I think kind of difficult to see because it's like, it's just a visceral reaction to being controlled. Well, I, I think that um, I, I agree with everything you said. And, I, you know, I think that if I could explain what this feels like to Kenny G, the guy we're talking to who may listen to this six, 60 years from now as he's going through his own cycle of crisis that, you know, Dave and I believe these things happen in cycles based on different books we've read and theories we've, we've kind of come to adopt is that we go through this every so often. Last one was World War II and the Great Depression. The one before that was Civil War. The one before that was Revolutionary War. Before that was Bacon's Rebellion or whatever it was. Like we have this, we have the cyclical pattern of these kinds of things happening yep. where these institutions are formed. And then over time, usually 80 to 100 years, they fall apart, they break down, they become corrupted and bastardized and band-aided and all those kinds of things. And it feels to me like all of us know that, that this is not going to end well. Right. None of us wants it to be a violent kind of a thing, right. but it is becoming very clear with the the types of language that's being used for the what I would call like the big three players right now, which I don't mean uh, big three as far as power, but big three as far as significance in forging this new kind of philosophy or ideology forward, which would be Trump, RFK, Jr., and Elon Musk. Yeah, and you can just listen to how the people in Media, uh, other institutions, Hollywood, uh, the, you know, uh, the the military part of the government, the White House, whatever. The language they use to describe these people is is um, not flattering, to say the least, right? No, no. And and I think that for those of us who are in that middle eighty percent, when we hear them talk about those three people, we're saying like, you guys are attacking these people as individuals, but. There's nobody else speaking for us. So when you're attacking them, you're attacking right. us by proxy. Right. Is that is that a fair way to explain what this is like for those those of us who are in the middle 80 percent who are not in ex either extreme or just blindly following the party we've been brought up to, to follow our entire lives? Yeah, 100 percent, because they, they make good proxies for. Uh, the people that want to be able to say what they want to say and, and do what yeah. you want to do, you know, the basic individual freedoms that um, that I think most of us actually want and see being eroded. And so it, it, it's fascinating to see then. Uh, so, so that attack against those is like, well, you guys aren't pulling the line, especially you guys aren't pulling the lines 
of your designated role. So Musk, you're a, a rich guy. You should behave like the rest of our rich guys. Yeah. Uh, you should behave like Gates and Mark Cuban and everybody else. Um, and and Trump, you should be uh, you you shouldn't be this kind of populist Republican out saying these things. You should be kind of in the Mitch McConnell vein and and such. Yeah. Uh, and and RFK, you're obviously you're not doing your Democratic duty. So and with the the thing that some of the other things that have happened recently that I think point towards at these this escalation is all of these things have happened. The RFK Trump uh, merger has happened. At the same time, you see an escalation by sort of the system, if you will, uh, around the world. You see, you know, X being shut down in Brazil uh, yep. because, you know, and and so this war of words and not, not just war of words. I mean, if if Elon landed in, in the Rio de Janeiro, he'd probably be arrested. Yeah, uh, for sure. You see the in you see in England, uh, you know, the. I mean, they don't have uh, a First Amendment like we have here, so they don't have free speech. In fact, we're unique on the planet in terms of yeah. our, our practical free speech. <clears throat> but you see people, you know, uh, protesting, and we talked about this before, protesting and and the government pushback. So you, you've got this escalating struggle between a system that's flailing and, and, and is being revealed, you know, the emperor has no clothes, <clears throat> and... and the folks that are like, no, no, the, the people that I trusted to um, to keep me uh, safe and to keep me uh, keep my freedoms and keep my my rights uh, there. And, you know, and COVID really kind of put a pin in it uh, They're They're not doing their job. So, no, we're going to entertain some strange ideas from people that normally we wouldn't get along with. Like, you know, tell me tell me four or five years ago that I'm going to have some. Um, increasing level of respect for RFK Jr. I'm like, huh? What? I mean, you yeah. know, he, I'm sure he's sincere, but some of the things he says, and even now, isn't that the, the vaccine wacko? <laughs> yeah, the the yeah you know, the yeah exactly. So, um, so I, I think there's, I think that's what's happening now, and I think it's going to happen um, with increasing frequency and in, increasing intensity, as yeah. because the you know a, a cornered and injured uh, wild animal <clears throat> doesn't want to. Um, doesn't want to give up. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that what, what, what I'm seeing is um, it's being unveiled, you know, let me back up, you know, for, for the majority of like the history I was taught of our country and the, in the experience in the country I lived through up until, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, whatever, um, was that the, the idea of our country was, People could say what they whatever they, whatever they wanted, and good ideas would lead to prosperity through innovation and and biz, businesses and things like that. And so that was the entire history I was taught, and and again lived for many years. And the idea was, we have laws in place that help people who are poor or middle class ascend the financial ranks, so to speak. Right. And what it seems to me has been happening is it's been unveiled that that is not as that's not the current system. At some point in time, whether depending on if you listen to some people, they say 10 years ago, some say it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago, somewhere along the, in the last 25 years, the, the, the focus shifted from helping uh, lesser income earning people ascend to maintaining the income potential for um, big companies and big government structures and things like that. Right. So, right. so. As that that awakening is kind of happening for people, they care less about somebody's position on vaccines. They care less about somebody's position sure. on abortion. They care less about somebody's position on, you know, other things that that Trump, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago would have been laughed at for saying or RFK. Now people are like, yeah, I can get over that. What I can't get over is a structure of government that is built to suppress poorer people and divide poorer people based on immutable characteristics like race and things like that. Sure in order to maintain the power and and profitability of bigger entities that's a complete turning upside down of what our country is quote unquote supposed to be about and so sure. it feels to me that that Elon Musk you know Trump and RFK Jr they are speaking to things that are more about values and principles and and who the laws and and who the the government should serve and that is resonating because they're speaking to things that, that about if you care about a country that serves the poor people and allows them to ascend and experience a freedom, then 
I can get over the the little the little things that they have here and there I don't agree with, but if you have a a a voice that is just telling us like the First Amendment might be dangerous, like okay, well wait a second here, I don't really care what your position on taxes is anymore if you're telling me the First Amendment is dangerous now, right? <laughs> and so it feels like there's this kind of uncoupling from um, party line talking points, historical party line talking points for some people. This is like you said, very, still a very small minority, probably. Or maybe it's maybe it's not so small. Um, we're uncoupling our our allegiances to those historical party talking points, and we're attaching our allegiances to yeah. But who's being served here? Is it big yeah. powerful people or lesser powerful people? And that I think is the the kind of at the heart of why these three guys came to are coming together. I mean, not like yeah. they're having meetings necessarily, but I, I think they are. But not, not like they're 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 working together to forge a path necessarily, but how they all kind of landed in the same lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's a, I think there's a, an awakening to uh, what I think a lot of what you're describing can be um, uh, sort of uh, colored out as the commoditization of people. In other words, yeah. people have become commodities. So, you know, in, in, in the liberal worldview of the, of the past, uh, you know, we, we want to help these people and the conservatives just conservatives want to help the people too. overall that makes a system so that anybody can rise. And so there's a, a difference the, in, in how we help people, but it's all about helping people. Um, and I think what you're describing is a, is that people become commodities. If they can be helped along the way, we'll do that if it serves our purpose of increasing our own power. Yeah. And, and as you say, then, and Trump, of course, is the perfect Trump in actually all three of those guys are perfect avatars for, for the, no, I'm not going to do that because all of them have blemishes. And, and yeah. as you say, people are willing to say, well, yeah, uh, I don't like Trump's mean tweets. And, you know, I don't like some of the things he says and his background, the way he treats some people. You know, there's there's things that I don't like about that. But what I really, really hate and what's an existential threat to me is not Trump on X, but what's an existential threat to me and my family and, and the future of the country is a tiny, tiny percentage of people that are manipulating all of the institutions and structures of power to maintain their own well, then at the same time, telling us that <clears throat> treating us as if we're stupid and telling us that, well, we're doing all of this for your own good. We're a benevolent right. dictator yeah, uh, yeah. at the same time. So and I, and I think the other the other piece that these three individuals bring to the table that is unique is I think part of the um, unveiling of the, the, the system, right? I, I, I don't like that word, but it's the best word I got for what I'm describing is that we, the people, elect a person who, who the idea was we elect a person who goes in and makes decisions and, and like makes, you know, drives policy and, and forges a path forward. And what's right. becoming clear is we elect a person who goes into an office who's then told by bureaucrats, here's what you can and cannot do. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and these three individuals are not going along with that. And right. so I think for many of us, again, in that middle 80 percent where, you know, on the far left or the far right, you're like, well, yeah, but you need those people who really know what's going on. And and right. the middle 80 percent is saying, yeah, well, look what that's gotten us. It's gotten us endless wars, taxes through the through the roof, uh, in, yeah. inflation through the roof, national debt through the roof, credit card debt for individuals through the roof, life expectancy is going down, childhood disease and obesity is through the roof. Like, OK, these quote unquote experts have gone us down the wrong path. We elect right. people who go in there under their premise of making decisions who are then hamstrung and told that they can't make decisions. Um, and I think that is part of what is, is attractive about these three individuals also is they don't just go along with what the, the quote unquote experts tell them and lead us down a, a path of just more war, more debt, more whatever. And, and I think that probably the, the <coughs> biggest, and this might be my, this is one of the biggest things for me. It might be one of the biggest things overall in, in all that litany of things that, that, you know, are offensive <laughs> from the system uh, is we're told you have to think the way that we think 
or right. else and say talk the way that we talk or else you are no longer approved and welcome in polite society so right. and and that's where i think you can get people together that you know it's kind of the enemy of my enemy is my friend type of thing you can get people together that have uh, legitimate disagreements on, you know, well, uh, vaccines and some of these other things, uh, taxes and, and, and I mean, even big issues like abortion. Um, you can say, well, we can get together with some people that disagree with me on these things because we got, we got a big dragon to slay first. And then we'll get back to our, our inter Nicene, <laughs> uh, debates about, you know, these different policies on taxation and, you know, how much of a safety net should we have and all those types of things. Once we've run Righted the system once we've righted the boat, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, th this to a much lesser degree, but, you know, all these experts telling us these existential threats like climate change and racism and all this kind of stuff, um, it's becoming abundantly clear that they really don't have solutions, but what they have is a desire for more taxes and more control. Right, right. And, and that is becoming more and more evident to people. And again, that lead, I think that's leading to people saying, okay, I just don't want to listen to the experts anymore. I don't want to go through another, you know, 18 month lockdown and, and being told that vaccines are the only way. And then come to find out 18 months after the fact that, oh, actually that hurt kids way worse than we, we thought it would. And oh, by the way, the six foot rule is something we just made up. And oh, by the way, the vaccine really does have injuries. I all, yeah. like, I think the, the experts, who the elected officials are forced to listen to once they're elected are proving themselves to be not very effective or, or capable. And so it's like, well, look at what you've gotten us. Like, look, look at where we are. We've had, we've had, um, we've been at war since world war two. Right. We have right. 750 military bases across the globe or some crazy number like that. We, we are in the regime change business now. That, that's our, right. that's our foreign policy is we just, pluck out people we don't like and put in people we do like and and like none of us want this yeah this doesn't represent our values at all yeah yeah and i, and I think they're the, the, one of the funny things about this is if the experts were really all that great at being experts uh they would have had us really going along with them but they're even bad at, at sort of their I, I mean, I look yeah. at things to a great extent because I'm a marketer from a marketing perspective. Their marketing really stinks because yeah. it's like the you know, average guy from Graham, Washington, and you know, from Arizona, you know, we can look at these things. And say, it's just, it, it, it fails the smell test. It fails the, you know, is this even sane test? And, and I think that's part of the, you know, if you, if we look at the, I, I would imagine if we went back and we looked at, at the, um, the way that individuals were thinking, if there were podcasts in the 1930s, uh, if there were podcasts in the, um, you know, in the 1760s, et cetera, <clears throat> we, we would probably hear people saying the exact same things. Yeah. It's like, you know, well, and we have enough writing from those times that we do know. It's like, yeah, the experts in England that are trying to run our economy here in America, the, the, you know, the, the institutions, the institution of parliament, the institution of the king have all uh, the institution of our of our local governors has failed us so dramatically. Uh, I mean, we just have to, you know, we have to be done with this and move on. So I, I think for Kenny G, I don't know what the institutions are going to be in 70 years, but I do know that they're probably going to be collapsing because yeah. that's what, that's what happens. Whatever comes out of this. So, we, we, you know, you're through a crisis, we'll set up new institutions or we'll yep. morph the existing institutions and we'll make them better as we think, or as our kids think they should be. And then, and they'll be better for a while. And then people start really seeing the cracks and they'll just eventually yeah. decline again. So I think yeah. that's one of the things Kenny G can learn from, our experience now. <clears throat> well, I hope one of the things that Kenny G can learn is that hubris is at the root of almost all of this. Yeah. And, and we all, every generation looks at former generations and talks about what rubes and dopes they were. And like, well, we wouldn't fall for that. And here we are like neck, we're like neck deep in the quicksand of this now after looking right. at back historically at the pilgrims and saying what idiots they were for not understanding. And how could the, how could the people in, in you know Germany, not see what's coming to them, and meanwhile we're in the same thing. And I think right. if you take you know a few fundamental ideas that we all know to be true, um, people go into government because they can't make it elsewhere. I think it's something we can generally agree upon. Uh, like yeah. really successful, smart, really capable people who could build a multi million dollar thriving business would not go into government. They would go build a multi million dollar business. Um, people 
uh, are promoted to their their level of incompetency, the Peter Principle. I think I think that we Peter can all principle. agree upon that as being a reality in many cases. And then when you throw in how they how they do anything is how they do everything, and that those three yeah. things alone will tell us the level of of competency and and success we can expect from government. And then when you you multiply that times the general citizen's apathy, like I don't want to be involved, I just want my life to be good, but I don't want to actually have to do anything. <laughs> like that's yeah. the perfect storm for these things to unravel. Like how how else could it go? Right. Well, yeah, and I think there's there's uh, there's there's hubris. A big part of hubris is self delusion. <clears throat> I can set up a system that's so good that it will overcome basic human nature. Yeah. You know, and so as as Kenny G looks at at the unfolding of things in in his time, these institutions that will will save us from, or the the, the people that will set up institutions a, after the next crisis. You know, there'll, there'll be the hubris that'll be involved is <clears throat> we're going to set up the utopia right this time. Yeah, they didn't get it right in the last go around from World War II. Yeah. They didn't get it right in the last go around after slavery and after the American Revolution, et cetera. But this time we're going to get it right. And our institutions and our our structures will be so good that it will even overcome human nature. And that's right. what the expert class now has has attempted to do. They've tried to overcome unchangeable human nature and thinking that, yes, our technology has evolved, certain societal standards have evolved, but base human nature is the same as it was 5,000 years ago. So, right. or, or you know, pick your time in history. So the, that, that kind of, when, when you see that happening, <clears throat> when you look and see that people are saying, well, we're going to, we're going to craft the perfect utopian uh, uh, system uh, and we don't need to worry about these things that Dave and Brian, you guys were talking about back then, because we, we're going to do this and we're going to mold humans to be what we want them to be. Then you know that the expert class has once again fallen for their own pride and for their own self-importance, their own hubris. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a solid point. So you take the, the handful of things that tell us that people in government are going to be inherently incapable. You have the apathy of the citizenry who doesn't want to have to be involved. They just want to go about their lives, which I'm not criticizing. Like I, I'm one of those people, you know? Um, And then you add in the arrogance of the people in charge who think that they can do no wrong. Like how else could this go than these things falling apart over a few decades? Like it it can't go any other way. Right. And maybe, maybe that's a piece of why this has such a cyclical nature is because the crisis for, forms us or forces us to start caring about outcomes instead of intents. And then over right. time, like a rubber band being stretched, we gradually care about people's intentions and politicians' intentions and the people in power's intentions more than we do outcomes until that's not sustainable anymore. And then overnight, we have to care about outcomes again. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that people realize then uh, when, when that happens, if they're, there is a sort of a, 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 a stripping away of all the pretense and of all the all the uh, you know technology is going to save us or you know or our our great military is going to you know wh- whatever I mean and we've got lots of great things we've got lots of great reasons now <clears throat> to believe that we could fulfill the utopian vision more than at any time in the past because we are technologically advanced we are uber wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice we do have the most powerful so we've got all of these things. But when the individual gets out of the spotlight and when the individuals, both the positives and the negatives of the individual uh, and, and, the, and the, again, base, the base human nature, when that gets out of the spotlight and all the other things get in the spotlight, that's when the system falls apart. And it's also when the individual becomes commoditized, as we were talking about earlier. As soon as the individual is, you don't exist for me as a public servant to serve, but you exist for me to perpetuate my own power, to perpetuate my own, um, the, to keep the crisis going so that, you know, I can help other people. Uh, when, yeah. when that becomes the, the modus operandi in the accepted modus operandi, even, you know, without, I mean, people, they, they don't hide anymore. Right. I mean, it's just, right. here's, here's what we're doing and it's good for I you. Think so that that's, that's an important thing to note. And I heard this uh, talk, a, a guy who's a, a physicist an economist and a, uh, geez, like a sociologist or something like that. He had like these, like <laughs> his interesting perspective to say the least. Yeah, like he that. mentioned something and something I was listening to a, a few days ago that, that 
you and I, you know, like we like you say, like the, their marketing sucks. Like they're if they're trying to convince yeah. us this stuff, like they're doing a terrible job. And his point was, what we don't understand is about 15, 20, 10 years ago, whenever it was, I think twenty fourteen was about time he pointed to, was that at that point in time they weren't trying to convince us anymore. They were just telling us what the rules are. Right. Yeah. And so guys like you and I are like, well, wait a second, your your PR, your marketing sucks here. Like you and I are missing the point here. <laughs> they're not yes. they're no longer in the business of trying to sell us on this. They're now in the business of telling us what is. And I think right. that, that that's something that that many of us, including me, are like really slow to come around to because it just it, it makes no sense unless you want total control, which again doesn't make any sense to me because I don't I don't imagine wanting to have total control over people. That that sounds like the worst possible life you could have to me, not the best possible life. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a couple of things I want to get into before we before we uh, run out of time today. Uh, so for Kenny G, this moment in time, RFK switching parties, like an earthquake happened in the in the in the our social fibers, I would say is a good way to put it. And it reminds the response from his family reminds me of you and I talked about a, a many months ago, maybe a year ago, even about during the Iranian Revolution in 79. There was there's a, a, a there's footage of a mom putting the noose over her son's neck. Yeah, who was to be, who was then hanged and executed yeah. for not going along, and I'm not saying RFK's family did that, but they put out a statement immediately after oh, yeah. he sure. announced this thing, like denouncing him, saying like, "Well, I can't believe he's doing this, and his father would be so disappointed, and we're basically like disowning him or whatever whatever right. their statement said." It's just again going back to as much as we think we've evolved, technology has evolved, our right. understanding of how to grow things and build things has evolved. But human nature has not evolved, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I I saw that, and I, th- you know, what I thought when I saw that, <clears throat> I thought, you know, as much as there's things I don't I don't agree with RFK, the guy has got some serious uh, courage to be able yeah. to go against a legacy that stretches back, you know, over a century. I mean, so years, yeah, it, that that was. That and I, I think this is also one of the appeals of the folks like Trump and Musk and, and RFK is it's not so much I don't agree with everything any of them say I mean right. but at the end of the day it's like we we do want to see people that have the intestinal fortitude to stand I mean it's it's Trump after he, I mean we talked about this before it's Trump after he got shot fight. Yeah fight yeah. i mean unscripted this is this is you know once you get shot you are yourself you know what your next yeah. things are the most honest things about you yeah. and you know it's it's not like well we're going to convene a we're going to con- uh, convene a an interest group to determine uh what we should say as a, in our press release yeah, after yeah. that no it's just right away and and i think there's people are so tired of the slick uh politician with focus group tested words talking to people and and thinking that then we're going to go along that yeah we'll take the warts we'll take it all just you know go for it and so i, I, I first always i go back to i always go back to lincoln talking about grant yeah. like after his yeah. seven or nine or whatever it was generals mcclellan and all those guys who kept telling him we can't do this we need more of this we need more of that here's the right. here's the thing we're supposed to do and he, he said I, I, I want grant he fights and that was his yeah, quote. He yeah. fights, and yeah. I, I, and that's right before their crisis. And I think that I think that ultimately, again, we when as we stretch from we leave a crisis because and we had to we had to focus on outcomes, and and values and principles. And over time, that gets changed. Where we we focus on intentions and convenience and ease and things like that instead of you know doing the right thing. Uh, I think that those things snap back into place fairly rapidly. And I think that's what I think that's part of their appeal for Elon. RFK and Trump is at least they're willing to take the tomatoes. They're willing to, they're willing to take the bullets yep. in, in some cases. And, and they know that their livelihoods, their lives, their status, everything that we yep. all as humans hold dear are all being risked by every one of these individuals. Right. And again, you get behind a person like that. You're like, I don't really care what his stance on abortion is anymore. <laughs> well, well, you, know, it's, it, you know that society wants that kind of person <clears throat> when the what, what, what do people say about Trump? They they say he fights. You know, for yeah. a while that really drove me nuts because I'm like, you know, I'm I'm thinking philosophy, I'm thinking political ideology. It's just kind of how I I think, <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, he fights, but 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 so what? I mean, what's he going to get? But then you know, I, the more I think about it, and you even see it on 
on the um, on on the left too, or on the on the progressive, whatever you want to call it, um, the, the communist, the, the communist side, <laughs> the socialist, the, the extreme arm of the left. Yeah. <laughs> but everything from every perspective is is about fight. So whether it was after you know all the the riots, the twenty twenty riots, <clears throat> whether it's the the speeches of we played uh, Randy Weingarten's. Um, uh, the teachers union uh, yeah. gal just, you know, woo, woo, you know, going, yeah. going nuts. So whether it's the right or the left, um, I think that that to me indicates that there is an inherent understanding across all philosophies that <clears throat> the, the system is utterly broken. It's completely yeah. broken in, you know, that we disagree on where it's broken perhaps between, you know, the right and the left. And in some cases we come together and we, you know, like in, in Germany or in, you know, with, uh, the, the three guys we're talking about here uh, come together on, no, we agree on these areas it's broken, but there's, <clears throat> there's a general societal wide understanding by pretty much everybody that it's broken. So, I mean, you, you take a look at the Harris campaign and well, day one, we're going to do this day. Well, what well, you're, you're, you're in power now. What are you talking about? You, if, if it was broken, then why are you saying you got to be elected to fix it? You, you know, yeah. you, you've had a chance to fix it, but so everybody, regardless of where they're at, thinks it's broken and now the question is you know what happens next but but again dave you and i perceive that when she says that she's trying to convince us and what what people who are insiders in the establishment who have kind of abandoned are saying they're not trying to convince you they're telling you what the line is they're yeah telling you yeah. the narrative you're supposed to carry forward right right yep. um yep. i think i think that um similar to this um uh uh grouping of these individuals who seemingly have different perspectives on a lot of things is the unveiling of how the the hard left that you know again i'll just say like communists like view our constitution and our founding right. documents and and yeah. our bill of rights and things like that i don't i didn't pull the clip up uh, i might pull it up later on because i think it's just it's so fascinating to hear a supreme court justice say this Kentanji brown jackson was quoted in a hearing saying something like i'm paraphrasing here but something like I'm really uncomfortable with how the First Amendment is hampering the government's ability here. <laughs> and you're like, you are the Supreme Court justice. The, the entire purpose of our Constitution and the Bill of Rights is to limit government. Exactly. It's not to grant abilities to citizens. The entire document is about limiting government's ability exactly. for overreach, exactly. specifically limiting the government's ability to stop speech. And her quote right. is something like, I'm uncomfortable with how this hampers the government's ability. <laughs> this First Amendment is really getting in our way. And now we're starting to see uh, a number of articles come out. Yeah. Um, like, here's one. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read this. I'm not, I'm not going to share the screen, but I'm going to read this. This is from the New York Times um, oh, yeah. sure. a few days ago. It says, here's the headline. The Constitution is sacred. Is it also dangerous? Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> and, I saw that. And I have a, 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 a number of these that I, we're not going to have time to go through them all, but I have a number of these where the the more extreme left side of the aisle is now just kind of it's being unveiled that the the real goal here is to undo the constitution yeah is it's been all these things have been happening policy changes and delegation to bureaucrats and and different priorities and things like that have all been done in the guise of like well we're 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 working within the confines of the, of the constitution to do this but now it's becoming clear for for you know people who are able to see the headlines and believe what they say and not believe that they're right. just speaking hyperbole. Right. Like they're actually saying like the constitution is the problem. And I think <laughs> that that kind of goes along with where Elon Trump and RFK are, are coming together. It's like, okay, we have different uh, opinions on abortion and, and taxes and, and these things, but we all agree the constitution is the, the standard that is to be met. Right. And people who are in the bureaucracy and the, the blob and the, the, yeah. the, Deep state, all that stuff, Wall Street media, that's not what they want. And it's becoming right. more and more clear, it seems to me, that they're they're just actually um coming clean with that. So here's some here's some of the quotes that I, I uh have come up recently. Um the constitution is broken and should not be reclaimed. Um we exactly. had to force the constitution to accommodate democracy and it shows. The constitution won't save us from Trump. Is the Constitution obstructing American democracy? Let's give up on the Constitution. That these are all like New York Times. Like these are you know yeah. the U.S. lacks what every democracy needs. 
this is the story of how Lincoln broke the U.S. Constitution. Uh, I, like, so it's <laughs> it's going back to like, how is this alignment happening? I think this is how it's happening. Is because these yeah. are all believers in the Constitution and what the intent was, which was to keep the government from squashing the little guy. Right. And and they're unified in that. And again, they're different. They're different talking points and priorities. Things like that might change. You know, they do, they do change, but it's all about like helping just like regular average people thrive in life, whether it's your health, like the, the Maha movement, make America healthy again. Like when yeah. he starts rattling off those statistics of like, what was it? One in a thousand or 3000 or whatever it was. Kids had autism in 1950. And now it's like one in 36 or something like that. Yeah. And over 50% of kids are, have uh, a, um, a uh, chronic disease. Like, right. <clears throat> these are indicative. These are symptomatic of a system that does not care about the health and welfare of, the citizens that yeah. in the health regard, and then the attacks on the First Amendment are it doesn't care about the citizens and their health and well being around their 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 spiritual ability, just like be free thinking people. I, I think that all these things are like being unveiled. That what what drives those three individuals we're talking about is at the core they care about the Constitution, right? And mm -hmm. what drives the other people is at the core they want to get rid of the Constitution. Yeah, Maybe well, I'm oversimplifying it, but it seems like that's where the battle on the battle lines are coming down to. Yeah, well, I, I think the it, it, on the flip side from from the from the Elon Trump RFK side, the, the the thought has been for a long time: well, we can wield the levers of power as they've been uh, given to us and passed down to us. The institutions, the Constitution, etc. We can use the Supreme Court, which they did for years, uh, etc. And we can we can bolster our power that way. But now <clears throat> there's because because it's all about the power. It's all about control and power, as we've talked about. So, but now we're at the point where, well, you know, we've done as much as we can to bolster our power that way. Now let's just go straight for the power. Let's yeah. move anything out of the way. I mean, there was another one you didn't read that uh, somebody uh, article recently talked about how the electoral college, which is a constitutionally oh, yeah. determined thing is actually election interference. It's right. actually undemocratic <laughs> when in reality, anybody who knows anything about it, it's, it's about the most democratic way of, of equalizing uh, power across a large nation that's ever been conceived. I mean, it's really a brilliant thing, but it it gets in the it gets in the way of power, and so yeah. therefore it has to go as well. So all of these yeah, things, the, the filibuster, evolved. the Supreme Court only having nine justices, all all these things right. that are being tossed about to to well, we'll just circumvent it this way. We'll get rid of the filibuster. That way we can do whatever we want in the Senate. We'll we'll right. pack the court with thirteen or fifteen judges instead of instead of nine, so we can make sure we get our our four or six added to to tip the scales in our favor. Like all these things are just about maintaining power. And, and again, for just speaking for me to Kenny G as a guy who grew up hearing little rumblings of this from like, you know, the, the weird uncle you only saw at Thanksgiving or the, the crazy coworker you had, you're like, yeah, whatever. Like that. Okay. Yeah. I, I get what you're saying, but that's not a real threat. Um, slowly coming, becoming aware over the last, you know, 15, 20 years of my life that holy crap, this really is a threat. <laughs> <laughs> and it really yeah. can happen here. And and that that awakening for me personally, just of going from a place where our country is the greatest country ever because we prevent this kind of stuff right. to <clears throat> learning that this stuff, like Ronald Reagan said, you know, democracy is only one 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 generation away. I, I heard those things. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like we we have these we have these institutions and rules in place to prevent this kind of stuff. It couldn't yeah. happen here. Right. And now it's becoming very clear it is happening here. And and as we learned from Mr. Bezmanov, if you a couple weeks ago, we're already decades into this by the time you and I are even becoming aware of the severity, yeah. right? And it is going to be a, a David and Goliath. It is going to be the colonies against the British Empire. It is going to be yeah. that kind of um, struggle. And I, I don't, I don't know how it's going to end up, you know. But but and then going back to Neil House point of when these four turnings happen, the crisis, we go through it and it sucks, and everybody says I never want to go through it again. But thank God we did. Yeah. This is becoming clear to me. Like this is the thank God we did part because this is not supporting the citizens. It's supporting the hundred thousand elites and mm. and whatever, not the three hundred and thirty million right. just everyday folks. 
as we go as we get through this, I think that is the part I would look back and say, well, thank God we did go through this because that yeah. was at risk and that is existential to the type of life we're trying to build for just everyday people. Right. And so I'm starting to kind of come aware of the thank God we did part, which I did not have that until a few months ago, probably. Well, and to be very explicit about it, the end game, <clears throat> the the end game and the two possible outcomes on this end game are, uh, and we're we're very close to that place in the chessboard, is tyranny or freedom. I mean, it, yeah. you know, again, I used to scoff at people who said that kind of stuff. Tyranny will never happen here. We've got this and this, as you said, we've got all these different fences that are around us, but the fences have been slowly dismantled and unwound. And so really the end game is either tyranny or freedom. And the fact that we are are at that place and people are waking up, if you will, uh, it indicates that, yeah, I don't want to go through it, but we're going to have to go through it. And, you know, that hopefully with the, the freedom side will win out once again. Yeah. Well, um, as with every good, you know, like Star Wars movie and Rocky movie and things like that, you know, I think part of the reason we're drawn to those kinds of things is because, you know, they, they, they face these massive obstacles yeah. and things like that. And that's why right. we were so happy when they went in the end. Yep. Um, on the flip side of that, if you look at historically speaking through the, you and I have talked about this before, the, the history of mankind, we're in like the one half of 1% of time that people have had this kind of freedom. Right. Historically speaking, we are the rarity. Like, yeah. I can't even state how rare it is to have yep. the kind of liberties and freedoms we've had. Yep. So historically speaking, the odds are against us of maintaining this, I would say. Uh, yeah, and I would also say it's worth fighting for Abs uh, yeah, a hundred percent. It's it's not a, the outcome is not a given in terms yep. of just history, but it's absolutely worth fighting for. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think for for Kenny G, um, I hope that he's uh, or Kenny Jane or uh, uh, what do we say, Car Carrie G? I don't remember what we yeah, named it, the fe the female avatar, but for <laughs> for Kenny Kenny G, um, you know, when Dave and I started talking about doing this, like, well, how did how did people live two miles away from Auschwitz and not know? And I think we're, I hope we're doing a good job of kind of uh, articulating how it's, that happened in our case. And yeah. I think that we are, we're not there yet, but I think we, we are seeing how the human nature uh, leads to these kinds of crisis moments. And we see the, the, the threats that people, again, going back to Neil House point of like, yeah, we'd never want to go through that again, but thank God we did. I, I think yeah. that it's, that part is becoming clear for, for more and more people. And as always, with the with the advent of new technologies and new new ways to manipulate and 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 trick people and control people, every every generation has a, a bigger hill to climb because of technological advances and things like that. But the underlying human behavior is always the same. Exactly, exactly. That's that's what, and, and that's why this is relevant. What we're talking about now will have different forms and different appearances and all yeah. that. You know, seventy years from now, sixty years from now, whatever. But the basic narrative is it will still be the same. I'm pretty sure yeah. somebody's going to want control and they're going to want yep. control under their criteria, not the previous regime's criteria, criteria, which for us was established in world war two. There was a, yep. an order established and now people have risen up through the sixties and seventies and they want control under their, their idea of what that is. And, and this, this, this is how it goes. So, exactly. all right. Well, Hey Dave, um, good to see you again. And uh, I'm glad I'm back from my vacation and we, we can do stuff a little more timely than we were doing it while I was yeah. gone. And uh, don't forget, you can check us out at unsilentpodcast.com. Uh, Rumble has a great comment section. We'd love to hear your, your thoughts on where we're getting it right and where we're getting it wrong, things we're missing, things you think we're on point with. Uh, again, our purpose here is to explain to future generations what this moment in time is like. And uh, Dave and I can speak for our perspectives, but certainly not everyone. So uh, go leave us a comment. Also, while you're on Rumble, uh, don't forget it's Dave and Brian against the algorithm. Uh, don't yes. forget to like and follow mm -hmm. and share and comment and all those kinds of things that that help us. Uh, the more people we can we can attract to help explain to future generations what this moment's like. Hopefully, the more we can help them um, uh, escape uh, uh, more dire consequences than they have to. So, exactly. yeah. Until next time, this is Dave and Brian signing off. See you next week. Do you want to be on silent? Make your voice heard on our social media channels and share where you think we got it right or wrong. Go to unsilentpodcast.com for social links so you can join the discussion. 